Ballygriffin, near the town of Kenmare in South Kerry, is the scene for a musical renaissance which links our oldest memories with the living sounds of Irish traditional music. To this 28-acre farm on the edge of a wilderness, Peter Kilroy, with his wife Corrie and children Ben Robin and Shiafra, have come to live out an older rhythm and to unlock some of the secrets hidden in the earth and materials of an Irish landscape. Here, they search for a forgotten sound and find themselves part of the rebirth of a queen among instruments, the Irish harp. Stone carvings like this thousand-year-old high cross in Castle Dermot show the existence of harp-like instruments in Ireland from at least that period. This slightly later metal book shrine of St Moog is a very clear example of the earliest type of harp, which was in vogue right up to the 16th century, when the Irish clan system went into rapid decline. A 16th-century woodcut of the McSweeney clan shows what would have been a typical scene, the clan poet behind the chieftain directs the performance of his praise poem, accompanied by the critter or harper. This magnificent 600-year-old harp in Trinity College, Dublin, is the earliest surviving harp in Europe, the same type of harp we've seen on the shrine of St. Moog 300 years earlier, and the inspiration for Peter Kilroy's harps. There's an oak there, but that's not much good to you, is it? No. Whether it's going to be any good for you, Pete? The harp it speaks through its sound box, hand. that part of the instrument nearest the player's body, and selecting the most responsive wood is what brings Peter and local sawmill owner Michael Collard to this forest near Glengariff. Willow is the usual timber used by Peter. The main problem is getting a tree to yield pieces large enough for a sound box which must be hollowed out from one solid piece of willow. Heartwood in the box causes it to distort and crack, and the piece must come from either side of the heart of a tree at least 30 years old. Heart rot begins to set in after about 35 years. The tree, therefore, must be found and felled in its prime. Right, so we've got this shake here right now. That way it could be slightly, most likely it goes hard to, through parallel to the heart. Right, yeah, but if you come too close to this line here. But by tilting this that way, as close as I can get in here without risking anything. Right. Get away with squaring it just to there. Is that enough for you, for a bed? Oh, it is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Cutting the heart out of a tree sounds almost cruel, but it is, after felling, the first important step in harp making. <coughs> The recognizable shape of the harp's sound box. The tree has given up its heart for the very heart of the harp's voice. Now is the time to do the rough hollowing of the box while the wood is still fresh cut and easier to work. The drying period will be quicker too, and unnecessary distortion and splitting will be avoided. Having created a honeycomb effect with the drill, he begins the rough hollowing with a small adz and we'll finish this stage of the job with a gouge and mallet.
This is good land for tree growing, and Peter already has willow cuttings of the white and grey sallow ready for planting out. In 30 years' time, the timber will come from his own farm. One of the secrets which Peter seems to have uncovered is the practice of burying the box in the bog while the cells are still able to absorb the oils and minerals hidden in this special ground. He has pieced together enough evidence to show that this could have been a common practice of the old harprites, as it certainly was with other woodworkers both here and in Scotland. And the finding of a solitary sound box in a bog in the last century may well find its explanation in Peter's inventive theory. His harps come in two sizes, the larger 29-string instrument and the smaller 25-string version. The boxes have been in the bog for three to four months. They must now wait for another four months before the timber is dry. In this open shed, they're protected from the rain, yet exposed to the natural drying properties of the air. Peter's younger son, Robin, is helping with the next stage of the harp, the neck, which runs out from the top of the sound box away from the player's body. The strings will, in the final product, run between the neck and the sound box. The whole process is very much a family affair, with Ben, Robin and Schiefre all lending a hand in their own way. The neck may also be made from willow, but in this instance Peter has chosen the denser timber of apple wood. The work of carving has begun. Everything here is based on the underlying form of three well-known harps from the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries, rather than later Irish harps which developed quite differently shaped necks sweeping upwards as they moved away from the sound box and they are known today as high-headed harps. This tiny finger plane is one of several tools Peter picked up in his earlier violin making days. Adrian Caldwell, a friend and neighbour of the Kilroys, comes over to help with the third structural part of the harp, the four pillar, which completes the triangular shape of the instrument by joining the neck to the sound box. Cutting out the T section, which characterises the four pillar, would be a very time consuming task without the help of an electric router, and this allows Peter to sell his harps at a lower price than would otherwise be possible. The time saved also encourages a natural cycle of rhythm which allows people, craft and environment to fuse creatively. Carving the stylized salmon or similar ornamentation on the four pillar must have taken anything up to a quarter of the harpwright's time. When the finished harp is eventually strung and tuned, the four pillar will have to bear up to three quarters of a ton of tension, and a denser wood therefore is used here than in the neck or sound box.
Working by night allows Peter to use a lamp to highlight the carving work in a way which is not possible in the diffused light of the daytime. Mm. and go up to the top D, which is the tune The harp and its music represents for Peter and Corrie at least one tangible aspect of a worldview which associated the properties of sound with life itself. This 14th century manuscript, the Book of Ballymote, has been linked through an inventive, if still controversial, theory by Sean O'Boyle with the ancient Ohm script found on over 300 standing stones, mostly in that region where the Kilroys now live. Was this some form of tablature for harp music? For Cory, the search for an answer is fueled by her belief that the harp was at once the symbol and transmitter of a druidic knowledge of the alchemy of sound. I think there must be something there. See? They could tell where the... Oh, we've gone down again. They could tell where the big ones were. When there was frost on the ground, they could see where it was dark. What's that? I don't know. I think it might be the methane. It just wouldn't uh, lie on the ground. Lie on the ground the same way. Yeah. It's getting slithery now. This. The fourth and final structural part of the harp, the backboard, brings us back to the magical landscape of the bog, looking for a tree not felled by any human being, but by time itself. Yeah, look, it's there as well. Oops. The difficulty of bringing the tree to a sawmill is avoided by the use of an unusual frame saw which Peter and Noel Burke put to good use. For Peter, the one part of the harp not visible to the onlooker while the instrument is being played has turned out to be what he considers the most important part. The backboard is made from bog pine and will eventually be fitted in a unique way into the back of the sound box. So the one I want is down here on either side of the heart so I get, get it on the quarter, right? You see how this disturbance is there? That kind of makes it not parallel oh, right, up, yeah. up here yeah. and the same here. Is that due to climbs at the time because the rings are much bigger here? Yeah. And if you look down here, they're really close. That's a massive change of climate here. Right. And this yeah. tree is what? You, you counted the rings, about 300? Yes, the tree is um, 300 years growing. How long do you expect it was in the bog before that? In the bog itself? Well, with the closeness of the rings, we're talking about a, a really cold, dry period. We know the end of the last ice age was about 11,000 years ago. But there could have been cold, dry periods since that time. Right. I mean, but, you know, it could be 5,000, it could be 11,000. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it is very, very old. Let's don't cut know. it. Yeah. Peter is following in the tradition of the old harpwrights in his choice of ancient Scots pine, which, because it has grown in a cold climate thousands of years ago, 
has a close grain structure which gives it a natural ringing tone. Lying in the bog, it has absorbed minerals which will dramatically affect its capacity for producing sound. In particular, silica salt has been shown to enhance the wood's natural resonance, causing it to produce clear, high harmonics. Peter's interest in musical instrument making can be dated to his studies with the violin maker Bill Patterson in the 1970s. Moving from making medieval violins and viols to making Irish harps, however, has not meant a complete change in the essential tools for the job. These dial calipers are a legacy from his violin making days, and here he uses them as he moves the sound box from the stage of rough hollowing to that of extremely fine and accurate thicknessing. Alain Fromont is a Frenchman who is held in exceptionally high regard by traditional musicians for his craftsmanship in making illin pipes. It's a very good thing that we have this automatic system mm. because it gives a lovely surface, you know, to the pin and the taper, the quality of yeah. the taper is excellent, you know. And everything the same, yeah, each pin exactly, identical. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing like that originally. I often wonder what sort of things did they have? Probably some wood turning mm. lathes mm. exist as well. I don't know what, what metal lathes, but I suppose they had some access to some sort of thing like that mm. to, to make it possible. Mm. The brass tuning pins, which are tapered and have to fit into the neck of the harp, are being turned and polished on the metal lathe. These pins will later be driven into the brass cheek bands placed on either side of the neck. Alain is another neighbour of Peter's who helps out in a way typical of craftsmen in this area. You see, Peter, the, the quality of the polishing straight mm. from the machine mm. is okay. It's beautiful, yeah. Is that, is that fine for that's you? That's fine, yeah, yeah, fine. Just what I want. Making the attractive string shoes is Ben's job. These are nailed through a strip of metal and into the piece of wood which is left in relief on the front of the sound box, called the raised string band. They're horseshoe shaped and their function is to prevent the strings from cutting through the wood. Meanwhile, Robin competes with his older brother by cutting out the cheek bands and drilling them. When they are placed on either side of the neck with the tuning pins through them, they'll protect the wood from being marked by the tuning key. The wooden parts of the harp, the sound box, neck and four pillar, must be assembled in the white, as it's called, to make sure that all the pieces interlock.
The strings are taken from coils of brass harpsichord wire as the nearest approximation to the medieval brass strings for which the Irish harp was noted. The knot in the end of the string will hold it in place after it's threaded through the little wooden toggles which prevent the strings from slipping through the string holes in the sound box. They'll also help to transmit the sound vibrations into the soundboard and thus take full advantage of the wood's natural resonant qualities. The neck is here wax polished and the rich dark brown colour highlights the natural grain of the wood. The traditional practice of burying the sound box in the bog, which Peter is now starting to do, results in a permanent deep staining. Ben's carefully made string shoes are nailed onto the raised string band on the sound box. These little shoes may even have been cast in former times. The cheek bands are mounted on either side of the neck in preparation for the tuning pins. Two brass reinforcement pieces are traditionally used to offset the three quarters of a ton pressure which will result from the strings being tightened. Without them reinforcing the join between the neck and the forepillar, the string pressure would pull the neck to one side. The modern Irish harp uses a system of blades in the neck to allow the harper to alter the tuning during the performance. These have no place in the medieval harp and the fine brass tuning pins will hold all the ideas of an inventive and musical player. Soon all the secrets of the harp will join together in a celebration of the natural and physical laws and in this way find its truest voice. In a little while the string tension will be brought up slowly and carefully. After a week it'll be almost up to pitch but it'll take four to six weeks before the harp stabilizes. The all-important backboard now comes into its own. Its initial fitting seems almost too loose, but when the strings are tightened, the tension causes the sides to bend inwards and the soundboard to rise into a graceful arch as though taking a deep breath. The backboard is gripped in a most ingenious manner which closes the entire wooden structure and it becomes a free-flowing channel of resonant sound. Every instrument has locked into its frame its own secrets. And in unlocking these secrets, Peter Kilroy has broken ground for a new generation of young Irish harpers and released a forgotten sound. Mm. You're going to bring it up to about a fifth below.